Thank you, Manny, and thank you to the committee for the opportunity. Uh, today, I'm hopefully going to shed some light on when to bypass, when to stent for treatment of popliteal artery aneurysms. Popliteal artery aneurysms, aneurysms have a male predominance. They are the most common peripheral artery aneurysm, and 30 to 50 percent have a concomitant abdominal aortic aneurysm. Popliteal artery aneurysms rarely rupture, however, they cause acute and chronic ischemia secondary to embolus and thrombosis, as is seen in the lower hand, uh, right hand side. To understand why we treat popliteal artery aneurysms, you have to look at the natural history. So back in 1991, Dawson looked at 71 popliteal artery aneurysms. 25 of those were observed and not treated. Of those 25, 50% of, um, of the symptomatic and 57% of the asymptomatic had complications, and that complication rate rose to 74% at five years. Salagi so noted that only 32% of non-treated popliteal artery aneurysms remained without lower extremity complications at five years. So in general, we treat popliteal artery aneurysms that are two centimeters or greater as there is a 30 to 40% risk of ischemia and a high rate of limb loss. We also treat almost all, uh, all symptomatic patients. However, the decision and technique on how to repair must be individualized based on the patient's comorbidities the anatomy, and the degree of ischemia. All popliteal artery aneurysms that are considered for treatment should have a CTA or an MRA. I usually prefer CTA from the abdomen all the way through the feet to see the extent of disease. Note concomitant abdominal aortic aneurysms. Note the anatomy, size, tortuosity of the vessels, and degree of thrombus, and to know the status of the runoff vessels. Acute threatening ischemia from popliteal artery uh, embolization or thrombosis has a three to uh, four times mortality and a higher risk of limb loss. Therefore, we try to fix these popliteal artery aneurysms before they thrombose or embolize. The asymptomatic patients or those with chronic ischemia undergo a, a medical or cardiac assessment. They undergo their imaging, their CTA or MRA, and then you have to decide versus open endo or observation. Open repair of popliteal artery aneurysms requires either general regional anesthesia. Uh, for the interventionalist, there's a posterior and medial approach. Uh, here's a quick few pictures of a posterior approach with a lazy S incision. And all the way on the right, you could see a, a saphenous vein interposition graft. And this is just a diagram showing uh, the medial approach where you ligate the aneurysm above and below and bypass usually with great saphenous vein. Five-year patency for open or all comers is 64 to 75%. However, if you look at the actual numbers of great saphenous vein versus PTFE, there's a 30% different with uh, much higher patency rates in primary and secondary for great saphenous vein, so we like to use great saphenous vein if it's available. Endovascular treatment of popliteal artery aneurysms arose as an alter alternative to open repair. It can be done under local anesthesia, however, it is an off-label use of a stent graft. Uh, the stent graft that we use is meant for occlusive disease in the leg, and it is not approved uh, for popliteal artery aneurysms, even though it's ubiquitously used. It is an off-label use. The first reported endovascular uh, popliteal aneurysm repair of a homemade graft was back at uh, my training grounds in Manny's Montefiore by your own uh, Dr. Marin and Dr. Veith in 94. These are the actual images and angiograms from the paper with a three-month post-operative duplex showing exclusion of the aneurysm and good flow through the graft on the right. Uh, we have published our data of endovascular uh, repair of popliteal artery aneurysms, our early experience back in uh, 2012. It was a retrospective review, 26 aneurysms. Mean diameter was around three centimeters and 62% were asymptomatic. We did have strict and do have strict anatomic selection criteria, which I believe is the, the key to success with two centimeter landing zones, minimal proximal and distal size discrepancy, lack of extensive vessel tortuosity, any young active patients or gardeners or carpenters that constantly bend the knee greater than 90 degrees uh, were not chosen for uh, stent graft repair, and anybody that had contraindication to antiplatelet medications were also not chosen. Technical success was 96%, length of stay a little over two and a half, a uh, little under two and a half days, Follow-up was near two years, and almost all patients were on aspirin and Plavix. Uh, these are just intraoperative shots of an angiogram. You do confirm the measurements from intima. In, intima. This is a stent graft in place, post-dilated with a balloon. You do a completion angiogram. Even though I don't have it here, you always show the runoff pre and post. And importantly, we always do an angiogram with the knee bent to look for any flow limitations or kinking caused by the stent graft. Notice the actual bend in the artery is always a few centimeters above the actual knee joint. 
Results, our primary and, and uh, secondary um, uh, patency at one year was 91%. Uh, at two years, it was 86 and 91 percent. There were no incidents of limb loss. There were three occlusions. One patient required a tibial bypass for a non-healing wound, and two underwent successful open thrombectomy. Importantly, all occlusion patients had single vessel or, or less runoff, and poor runoff was the only predictor of stent graft occlusion. It was just a recent paper published this May. Uh, of another review of popliteal artery aneurysms that also revealed runoff as a, a uh, primary factor for decreased patency rates in popliteal artery aneurysm repair. Um, we do have non-published data. We looked at our endovascular versus open experience from 98 to 2013, 79 patients, uh, 36 open, 43 endo, similar cohort. Follow-up was much longer in the open group at 75 versus 34 months. Interestingly, the five-year Kaplan-Meier patent primary patency was higher for the endovascular group, although it was not statistically significant, and secondary was the same at 90% for both groups. As you would expect, endovascular had a shorter length of stay. There was one amputation in the operative group, and like our prior data, single vessel runoff predicted a higher occlusion rate. Looking at other uh, data, Mohan looked at 30 popliteal artery aneurysm repairs, uh, uh, endovascular, three-year primary and secondary patency at 75 and 83 percent, which he said was similar to that in open surgery. Uh, TLU et al. Uh, looked at 73, five-year patency, uh, five-year primary and secondary patency at 70 and 76 percent, which isn't bad, but that primary patency increased to 80 percent with experience and the addition of uh, coplavix. Uh, Antonello et al. Uh, looked at the only prospective randomized trial that I found, 30 popliteal artery aneurysms. No difference in limb salvage and patency at four years. The endovascular group did have decreased operative time and length of stay. Uh, Lovegrove looked at a meta-analysis. Again, no difference in long-term patency, decreased operative time uh, and length of stay for endovascular repair. <laughs> He did find that endovascular repair was more likely to have thrombosis and reintervention within 30 days. Looking at multi-layered stents um, and why we don't use them, Thacker published six popliteal artery aneurysms using multi-layered stents and had a 50% occlusion at six months, which is unacceptable. And Antonou uh, published six popliteal aneurysms in three patients. At nine months, they had a 33% occlusion, uh, so multi-layered stents is not the answer. So to conclude, endovascular repair of popliteal artery aneurysms is relatively safe uh, with patency and limb salvage rates comparable to open repair in patients that have appropriate anatomy, and I think that's key. The decision timing and technique to perform open or endovascular repair of popliteal artery aneurysms must be individualized. So to answer the question when to bypass and when to stent, I think if the anatomy is good, including the runoff, uh, usually stent is our first choice. However, patients with poor runoff are now offered a bypass uh, rather than a stent graft. Uh, if they're young and catchers or carpenters that constantly flex their need uh, greater than 90%, they're offered a bypass. If the patient has compression symptoms and need to be decompressed, they get done open. Uh, and most patients that have a contraindication to antiplatelet medication will be done open. When you have the very high medical risk and very old, uh, sometimes we push the limits with the stent graft, but don't forget uh, there's always the option of observation, and I thank you for your time. <laughs>